Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the first International Crisis Group Africa Programme's online event, Defeating the Spike in Jihadist Attacks in Niger's Tilabari. We hope this will be the first in a long-standing series of virtual seminars on conflict and crises in the continent. I'm really delighted today to have with us Hannah Armstrong, um, Crisis Group Senior Analyst for the Sahel, and the principal author of, our, of the report we will be discussing today, and also Dino Matani, the Africa Programme Deputy Director. My name is Alyssa Jobson, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. Sidelining the Islamic State in Niger's Tilabari is the latest in a series of reports on the complex conflict in Niger and is part of a substantial body of work examining the crisis in the Central Sahel, that's Mali, Burkina and Niger, that Crisis Group has undertaken since 2012. Before I hand over to, to Dino, who's going to situate the report in our regional work, I have a few housekeep, housekeeping issues that I'd like to deal with. Uh, first of all, the format of this um, seminar, uh, each of the speakers, Dino and Hannah, will speak for seven minute, minutes each, followed by uh, a Q&A. Just let you know that this session is being recorded. If you'd like to answer, ask a question, please use the Q&A function. You'll find this at the bottom of your screen um, on the right hand side of the bottom bar. So if you, wish to, if you wish to ask a question, please use that function. If you could also uh, cite your name and affiliation, that would be great. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Dino. Thank you, Dino. Hi, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just to situate maybe the, 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 the report, which perhaps some of you have read um, on, on, on the security situation in uh, um, Niger's Tilaberi region and the suite of policy recommendations that lean towards sidelining the sidelining of Islamic State um, in that in that in that area. Um, it, it's, it, it is part of a trend of work that we, um, you know, has been revealed to us by our own research. The more that we've dug into uh, a number of conflicts uh, around the map in, in Africa that that relate to you know, the, the, the primacy of uh, community relations. Um, and, and so, you know, for example, we, we have a, a number of publications that, that are already out there and that are um, also in the works, um, including uh, this report in Niger that uh, touch on, on that theme. And, and we look forward to, to hearing um, very much from Hannah in detail on, on the specific findings related to, to Niger. But what we see around the continent is when it comes to, um, you know, the emerging or growing threat of um, violent extremism um, in places like Nigeria or even Mozambique, in the Sahel um, uh, and elsewhere, that <coughs> it, the, 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 <coughs> the emergence of um, violent extremist factions or the, the penetration of of groups like Islamic uh, State or, or, or Al Qaeda affiliated groups into into some of these areas really um, have 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 um, you know have, have a lot to do with the community tensions on the ground. So, if you've seen our report on on Nigeria, which was recently published in the last uh, um, weeks, uh, that one really focused on. Um, uh, north, north, uh, western Nigeria, and looked at um, really the, the the tensions between um, primarily Fulani herders and Hausa um, farmers, and um, looked at how the conflict between them has really generated a, a you know a, a very messy situation there, um, um, giving birth to all manner of criminal groups, uh, roving criminal groups. Um, and, and creating, you know, um, uh, uh, an overall um, security situation spiral that that um, Islamic um, jihadist groups are now starting to exploit. The same goes for a piece of work that we're doing on, on Mali. Um, you may have read um, in the past some of our work on 
um, dialogue with the bad guys in Mali, where we looked at um, central Mali in particular, where we have a follow-up to that report coming through, which really looks at the community relations between Dogon, uh, agriculturalists and Fulani, again, herders that has created, um, given rise on the one hand to um, vigilante groups, on the other hand, um, you know, given the open the opportunities by, for, for Islamic um, jihadists to exploit those community tensions and, and team up um, for the large part with, with, uh, with Fulani uh, cattle herders. And, and those tensions were very much sort of uh, exacerbated by local issues from land disputes, cattle rustling, um, you know, and, and even the government's agricultural policies, which have favored, um, you know, for decades, agricultural production over pastoral, um, the pastoral economy. Um, so <clears throat> uh, another example, a final example before we turn to Niger is, is, is work that we're doing on, on Mozambique now. Um, many of you would have seen in the news, the rise of Islamic State um, affiliated groups operating on the ground in Cabo Delgado. Well, as we start to, to, to dig into to, to our research in that respect, we, we started seeing similar, very similar trends again. Um, looking at uh, the relations between ethnic groups on the ground who, um, some of whom, the minority of whom uh, are, are um, uh, you know, have, have grievances against the state for not being cut into some of the oil development plans that are, oil and gas development plans that are going on on the ground. So when, when I think the overall thrust of, of this report, which, and the real value of this report on Niger, which reflects a lot of these emerging themes when it comes to violent extremism on the ground in Africa, um, is most useful when we, when we think about the policy recommendations and how to balance military and non-military approaches on the ground. Um, Hannah will walk us through today, um, you know, uh, the dynamics in, in Niger's February to illustrate how the, the military operations that have been going on haven't always um, resulted in, in the pacification of, of, of the area. In fact, quite the opposite, um, when at times those operations have stirred or exacerbated those inter-community tensions. And so <clears throat> the solutions to many of these problems lie um, perhaps in non-military approaches that open, open themselves up to being exploited by state actors and their partners in terms of reaching out to um, uh, local community groups for dialogue by way of peeling them away from the jihadis, addressing their root causes, their root concerns, and the root causes of, 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 of these conflicts. Um, so, so with that, um, I'll turn over to, to Hannah, um, you know, who's going to drill us down, narrow the discussion down very much on, on this particular report. But, um, uh, you, you know, we'll, we'll also illustrate many of these broader points that I've made in respect of Niger itself. Over to you, Hannah. Thanks very much, Dino. And thanks for everyone who, who has come and, and is interested in engaging with this report. Um, we saw a few ago the report of the killing of Abdul Malik Jukdal, the leader of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which certainly suggests a significant victory for the fight against Islam Sahel. However, when you look closely at regions where more communities are being swept up in violence between states and jihadis, such as the Mali Niger border region, the picture looks very different. I'm going to briefly talk about the factors that have facilitated the rise of the Islamic State in North Kilabari, and also about how Niger has worked to manage the crisis using both political and military means. Uh, the crisis in this region is multi-layered and it is growing worse, uh, as can be seen most recently by the allegations that 102 civilians from border communities in North Calabria were executed by security forces in April. So it was towards the end of 2019 that North Calabria began to really be seen as a quite serious site of conflict. Um, at that point, there were two significant attacks on security forces that took place uh, within a few weeks of one another. Uh, the one at Inates in, in December, which killed upwards of 70 soldiers, and then the one at Chinagodra, which killed um, nearly 90 soldiers weeks later. These attacks may have 
have been more sophisticated and had a higher death toll than earlier ones on Nigerian forces in this region, but they were also consistent with spiraling violence uh, between militants and security forces. And this violence has come in waves in this zone, starting in the 1990s at least, uh, and then reactivating during, during the early years of the Mali rebellion that began in 2011. In the wake of that rebellion, cross-border militant groups became stronger uh, as various opportunities arose for armed men on the Malian side of the border. So too did the need for men to arm themselves um, to protect their communities and their livestock from raids and attacks by their rivals. So during this time, we saw various jihadi and self-defense groups emerge with different relations to one another. Um, and then over the following years, the lines sort of hardened between cross-border groups that were on the side of the state and cross-border groups that were not on the side of the state. Initially, the militant activities of these groups were more centered on Mali. Um, as we know, the epicenter of the crisis has, has moved in the past few years from northern Mali into central Mali, into the Lipakogorjan uh, tri-border area, and including the border of, of Niger, um, creating a very unique and complicated situation for the Nigerian authorities. So how they dealt with it? Uh, well, in 2016, around the time that jihadi groups first began really targeting North Tilabari, uh, there's an early connection established between Islamic State leader Abu Walid Sahrawi and the Nigerian authorities. Um, this was to discuss the release of a kidnapped National Guard. Uh, although the Guard was released, the talks fell apart, ushering in a new offensive. Uh, Niger really found itself at a military disadvantage in a zone where its own forces were not well established and where local communities were often aggrieved. Um, therefore, Niger granted uh, uh, permission to Malian militias, the Gatia and the MSA, who were partnering with Operation Barkhan uh, to do cross-border raids, uh, counterterrorism raids. So the problem was that that pit communities in the Mali Niger border zone um, who were already experiencing high tensions between themselves um, against one another at a, at a much higher level. Uh, so this is an area where Dosahak and Tuareg groups have, have a strong rivalry with the, the pull that was deepened by this um, cooperation between Niger and, and uh, the MSI and Gatia militias, which are, are Dawsahak and Tuareg militias. Um, although on their side, the French and Niger claimed that um, these raids carried out by Esa and Gatia in North Tilaburi had killed many militants, people on the ground told a very different story, uh, describing raids on baptisms and innocent pastoralists, and the net effect of this being that many more were driven to join the Islamic State. So it was really sort of the, the opposite of the intended effect. By the time Niger put an end to these campaigns in the summer of 2018, militancy seemed to have quieted down, but there was a great deal of damage uh, that had been done to the ties between the state and the communities in North Tilaburi, including Tuareg and, and Dosahak. Um, between the end of 2018 and today, as, as we've seen, the Islamic State came back much, much stronger. It has become more sophisticated in terms of its military objectives and operational capacities. It has built extensive links with diverse communities in North Tilaburi, um, at one point considered to draw its strength mainly from pull groups. It has, over the past several years, built a broader base of support across regional ethnic lines. So it now includes Dosahak, Toreg, Zerma, and Hausa, um, militants and, and communities. These developments have really affected the state. Uh, they've diminished its reach in the border zone as the Islamic State has built broader support. They've strained or even broken ties to border communities who then feel left to fend for themselves. Uh, dozens of local leaders close to the state have been targeted for assassination, assassinated or abducted, and military posts like the ones at Inates and Chinagozar have been overrun. Um, tens of thousands have been displaced. Those who do stay often forge symbiotic relationships with the Islamic State, paying taxes and curbing some of their religious practices in exchange for protection against raids. Um, interestingly, there's a sense that the Islamic State in this area is behaving very differently um, from the Islamic State in, in the Middle East, for example, or even from the Islamic State in um, Burkina Faso. So in, in North Tilaburi, um, there's a sense that although 
this group is linked to banditry and abuses, um, it's not fundamentally unreasonable, and that its leader is a decent man. This is something that, that is, uh, even in security forces who've, who've worked in the zone, this is something that you can sort of pick up on, uh, this perception. IS fighters are not seen as committing theatrical acts of violence, as we saw with ISIS in, in the Middle East, for example. Um, and on the other hand, as we've, we've seen throughout the Sahel region, uh, exactions by the Malian, Nigerian, and security forces are going up. Um, we already mentioned the, the uh, reports of 102 civilians being killed. Nigerian authorities, compared to Mali and Burkina Faso, they have a few strong advantages when it comes to dealing with these groups and, and this uh, turmoil. Um, they have not launched their own ethnic militias or vigilante groups. Uh, they have more successful experience speaking with and mollifying rebel groups than, for instance, Mali. And they also have more institutional continuity over the past decade and can draw on bodies like the HACP, who are led by uh, and composed of border populations and who are committed to finding compromise between center and the margins. However, they are in a very difficult position at the moment um, where various approaches they have tried seem not only to fail, but sometimes to make militancy worse. Uh, they were not able to negotiate with groups for a number of reasons. They were not able to militarily defeat groups. Um, other forces who they allowed in, who seemed to have an advantage in fighting these militants, uh, had the adverse effect of, of making them stronger. And when Niger has tried to quite sensibly work more directly with communities and even offer amnesty to fighters, um, this had the adverse effect of, of putting many at risk and, and not convincing many to, to come back. Um, so when Niger went back on the offensive following the PAO summit in France, when G5 actors decided to focus their efforts on Islamic State in the tri-border area, Niger was immediately faced with what seems to be a terrible atrocity brought by its own forces on the very communities that they seek to win back over. The outcome of all of this is a lot more disorder for the Islamic State to exploit, as Gino mentioned earlier. Um, to sort of wrap it up, it's, it's certainly not easy to find the right balance between military and political operations in a fight of this size and, and this nature. Um, however, Niger is in a relatively promising position um, to do more on the political front and should not let the interest around counter-terror operations um, distract from, from the fundamentally political challenge uh, that it has in, in front of it and the need for a really strong, ambitious political response. And as we go out, go into in the report, um, this response should really focus on seeking to address border community grievances, uh, ending uh, inter and intra-communal conflicts, and engaging in dialogue with militants to explore ways to distance them from uh, jihadi or extremist groups. And I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, we've got a number of questions uh, that have come through. And as I said before, if you'd like to ask a question, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, the first batch of questions really relate to the issue of, um, of you know, how, 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 do, how can we have a um, a resolution that isn't military and also how do we balance the um the 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 needs of the internet intercommunal communities so the first question we have is you know what 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 solutions do we feel there are to to ending violence between uh, intercommunal violence and secondly um a question about the dialogue which i think is one of the things that we say is is really important uh, both dialogue between communities but also with islamist states as being one of the key um issues uh, key key recommendations that, that could actually sort of help move away from a military um, a military solution. Um, we have a question asking why did the talks collapse between um, the the government of Niger and um, IS groups in 2018? Um, you know, there's a sense that we need to understand what how that why that failed before we can sort of think about how we can out do outreach again and how we might have a, a successful outcome in the future. Thank you. Hannah, do you want to, to take that first? 
You're on mute, Anna. Hi, okay. Um, thank you. Thanks for the listen. Thanks for these questions. Um, in terms of ending intercommunal violence, or at least addressing intercommunal violence, there were a couple of interesting examples that we came across in our research on, on this region um, of areas where there had, had really been um, some, some progress or at least some, some attempts, which then hit some roadblocks. But it's, it's important and interesting to sort of note um, that these efforts are going on and that um, you know, they sometimes could use more support or better coordination by, by the actors who are, um, who are initial, initiating them. So in particular, um, and we, we talk about this in the, in the recommendations uh, part briefly, the, the, there was a sort of, there were a few different peace treaties signed in, in the region of Abala. And um, one account of how that happened was that uh, it was the jihadist groups themselves who um, proposed a, a sort of um, entente after uh, defeating their, their militia rivals. Um, in the interest of you know, stability and, and being able to operate economically. And another account is that uh, there was a, a process um, to kind of reach out by, by a, a, the mayor, uh, the deputy mayor of, of, the, of Abala um, to you know, put an end to violence between the communities, um, in particular between the, the Dosa hack and the, and the pole, I believe. And um, they, they, signed a, they signed a sort of ceasefire, a local ceasefire. And, um, you know, in whatever the sort of origin of, of this entente, um, it seems to have held pretty well. And it's interesting for a few different reasons. Um, one, of the, one of the scariest things about looking at, you know, mediation in this zone is seeing people get killed uh, when they try to mediate on behalf of government. Um, you know, this is, this is obviously quite, quite terrifying and, and a very strong... Um, disincentive to anyone who might be who might be disposed to, to fill that role. Um, and what's what's interesting when you look at examples like Abala is you see that there can actually be someone who is a, a government official, a state official, um, who has visibility in the region and who is able to um, to link himself publicly to a ceasefire agreement without becoming a target of, of jihadi groups. Um, so I think it it shows that people who are uh, I think it shows that it, it doesn't make you necessarily a target um, just by sort of going into mediation, but that there are, there are sort of different ways of um, stepping into that, stepping into that capacity. And some of them um, are, some of them are able to sort of work and others are, are end up being quite dangerous. Um, like with the case of Inatas, for example, where, as, as we mentioned in the report, um, several, I think maybe three to five um, people who were, who fulfilled quite strong roles for the state in that zone were, were targeted and assassinated um, by, by jihadi groups. Um, so in terms of solution, to bring it back to this idea of, of you know, how, do you, how can you approach this more um, effectively or, or competently, I think it's really important to draw a distinction between um, mediators or act, state actors who are involved in, in political dialogue with communities uh, it's really important that they not be involved in military operations. It's really important that they not be seen as, um, you know, a part of an intelligence structure that's trying to locate and neutralize jihadis, because it's at that point that these representatives of the state become um, targets. And you could sort of see at least the logic behind that on, on the other side. Uh, so in the case of Abala, you know, it, it may be that one of the advantages that the um, that this figure who you know who has been public and has presided over this, this ceasefire agreement, which certainly at least had jihadis, um, uh, you know, tacit uh, support um, is, is, you know, I think, I think there's a, a key role being played by um, having a really strong line between figures like this, how they relate to military operations um, or intelligence structures or how they, how they don't. And, and they're a lot safer in, in the latter case. Uh, so the temptation, you know, on the, on the part of the state is, is quite great to use people like this who do have access to these figures or to people close to these figures um, to try to, you know, for, for military purposes. But it's, it's very important to sort of uh, draw, draw a clear line and, and create space for these kinds of um, dialogues to occur without, you know, the, them being perceived as directly threatening to, to jihadi militants. Um, and then to go to... Uh, the next question that I sort of picked 
picked up from 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 that Alyssa was the why did the talks collapse between the government and, and Islamic state groups? Um, there were, and we've actually, we actually also talk about this in the 2018 report on the mali Niger border, which looks also much more at the Malian side of the border. Um, there were a number of reasons that the talks fell apart, but I think the interesting ones to sort of look at moving forward um, is really the sort of lack of consensus and coordination on, on the side of this, this state, various state actors, um, and sometimes actions by foreign partners that directly put in jeopardy um, these, these types of talks. So, you know, foreign partners will make a strong point of saying that, um, you know, all of their actions are, are approved in advance by um, state authorities, but I think the, the reality on the ground is that um, sometimes what we hear from state officials or people who've been involved in, in mediation efforts is that um, sometimes foreign partners, often without even really wanting to, um, are via their actions putting, um, restricting the space for, for dialogue initiatives or, um, you know, do, having kind of parallel military operations that then make those dialogue initiatives look implausible or, or weak or, or not promising. Um, so I would say that the, the area that, that really needs focus is um, at the level of the central state between political authorities and military authorities, and also in terms of coordination between uh, foreign partners and, and NIAME, and when it comes to these types of, of efforts. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, staying on the question of dialogue, but moving back a bit to this, this question of, of how to um, address intercommunal grievances, um, Anna Schmauder, who um, previously was, a, was an intern with Crisis Group, has a question on, um, on the role that you see for customary authorities in, uh, in addressing these grievances between um, border uh, communities. Hannah, do you want to take that one? I, I, I was going to take some other ones, but you can, why don't you take this one? Because I think this is quite central to the work that you've, um, that, that you, that, that the research that you did. So, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, the, the, in terms of customary authorities, it's a, it's a very, very strong role. Uh, their position is more and more untenable um, as the line gets harder between the state and, and the jihadi um, forces. Uh, so, you know, again, we've seen, we've seen um, quite a few uh, assassinated or abducted or targeted. Um, and yet there are others who are still there, um, who are still fulfilling their roles. Some have been displaced and, and instead of being in their, in their villages or areas, they've moved into Tsilabri or Tenyame. Um, this gives them less reach on the ground. So, um, you know, it's, it's certainly their, their role is certainly uh, key in terms of um, maintaining and hopefully building on the links that they, that they um, command to community, to border communities. Um, but it is imperative to sort of uh, work, that the state work with them very, very carefully given the high risk um, to, you know, leaders in this area who do coll collaborate with the state. Um, and also it's important to sort of keep in mind the way that their um, the way that their position has has really um, changed, you know, given given how the state has has been um, forced to sort of walk back its presence from part of this area, and how communities have in in some areas either you know fled the zone entirely, or if they do stay, um, have developed links for the sake of survival um, with Islamic state militants. Uh, thanks, Hannah. And I think one more one more question specifically for you. This one from um, Marius Bayer from GIZ. Um, they ask, um, do you have any recommendations? Do we have any recommendations on how civil society organisations can engage in in Niger and um, you know, in particular relation to some of the, the the recommendations that we have in the report, especially around dialogue? Is there a role there for civil society? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not muted. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's a really important um, issue. You know, there's, there's a, I think in this context, it's good to sort of rethink this idea of, um, it's quite common, sorry, quite, quite common currency to speak of the, the security um, development nexus in the Sahel. 
and what this what this ends up sort of looking like in in zones like this is more and more um, types of services are being offered to you know that, that military bases or that security areas are being used as places where services can be offered um, to communities and this is this is really kind of a, a tricky um, a tricky area it's it's not it's not a very good idea it has a lot of potential to kind of put more stress on areas and create more damage sometimes by empowering certain actors at the expense of others and sort of fueling tensions instead of instead of calming them um, so so in a, in a brief nutshell um, that's sort of a, a, an example of sort of what not to do or what to what to think very very carefully before doing and um, a good example of how those kinds of practices can go wrong is the, the PSP SDN in, in Northern Mali, um, which was an effort to bring development and which was, was sort of presented as an effort to bring development to Northern Mali. Um, but in reality, it was, a, it was a construction of several different security bases, um, the empowerment of actors on the ground via these security bases that was then perceived as threatening by their rivals who then uh, waged a rebellion. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important to kind of um, I think it's really important to, to think about um, these development and political efforts, you know, again, as, as quite distinct from, from military operations, you know, or at least to sort of create an autonomous space for these kinds of initiatives that doesn't um, rely so much on, on the presence of security or on being embedded in, in um, the presence of security. So, you know, there are, there are really interesting initiatives um, to, you know, for instance, to facilitate the return of, of stolen cattle, of stolen livestock. This is a huge um, grievance that border communities have is that their animals are not protected. Um, their animals are their banks, so if their animals get taken. It's it's you know their 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 whole family's livelihoods are are shattered. Um, so there's you know there are there are, um, you know NGO efforts, civil society efforts to um, kind of create more communications to allow for um, you know restitution of of those types of animals um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the security, the security challenges make it make it difficult at this point. Um, but the other, I guess, the other um, sort of civil society initiative that that I thought was interesting was was um, you know efforts to sort of promote intercommunal dialogue, inter and intracommunal dialogue, um, you know, and, and in ways that also help the state um, regain some some role in in this zone, which is which is troubled. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Dina, do you have anything to, to add, particularly around this question of, of dialogue? Yeah, I mean, I think put very, I mean, almost simplistically, um, you know, it, it, when it comes to dialogue, it's really drilling down to understand what the community concerns are. One example that we've given in the Niger report is, for example, the representation in security forces. And the, 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 the recommendation there that we, we came up with in consultation with those that Hannah has been speaking to very much on the ground, um, you know, that there is a, a sense of, of um, alienation amongst the Pearl community uh, in, in Tel Aviv because they've not been um, absorbed into the security forces, uh, in addition to which they've been targeted by um, allied militia of the, of the Nigerian government in the past from, from other tribes. Um, so, um, you, you know, blending more of them into the security services definitely, you, you know, would, would make a difference, particularly those units that are deployed in the area, although we caution that any unit that would be comprised of any given community shouldn't be um, then uh, deployed into um, uh, an area where uh, their so-called rivals are, are in the minority and therefore um, leave that other community in a sense of, um, you know, facing, facing possible insecurity. Um, once these sort of issues are addressed at the local level, you know, through exploratory thoughts on the ground, be it, you know, resolving a land dispute, be it, be it resolving issues related to, to cattle rustling that are um, uh, uh, exacerbating tensions on the ground, then, then you can actually um, perhaps stand a chance at peeling off those um, um, uh, um, national elements on the ground. What I mean by that is when, when we look at violent extremist groups, you often have 
the, the, the local jihadi commanders, the rank and file, but also, um, as Hannah mentioned earlier on, the likes of somebody like Drukdel, who's not from the country, you know, is a North African from, from, from outside the country, but has, has implanted himself into the Sahel region, um, similar as, as, as Sarawi, the, the, the IS leader of, of, of the Sahelian branch. Um, and, and so, you, you know, by addressing, by opening dialogue with national figures, you stand a chance of pulling them away. And then, you know, there is the option of, of military option. Um, nobody is suggesting here, at least, that going after Drukdel was the wrong thing to do. Um, he's been killed now. Um, there could also be dialogue with somebody like Sarawi in the final analysis, but you've got to, you've got to weaken the base around him. Um, and the best way of doing that isn't necessarily to, 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 to launch heavy military operations, especially in um, a situation now where um, there's much less mobility on the ground or monitoring of those military operations in, in the context of COVID-19. Um, and, um, you, you, you know, the, 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 the opportunities that are given um, uh, from dialogue May, may, may well um, lead to much better results on the ground. And certainly this is the basis on which we have recommended dialogue with the likes of Hamadou Kufa in Mali, who's a Fulani um, military commander from the Mopti region. Um, as a national, as a Malian national, there stands a greater chance of dealing with somebody like him um, and addressing his community's concerns, thereby peeling him away from the broader um, Jainim uh, umbrella group. Um, I did see another question here about, um, which I thought was interesting. It's, it's beyond the scope of this specific um, uh, discussion on Niger, but, but I think it's worth answering. There's a question here on the relationships that we see between Islamic State and other jihadist groups in the region, whether in Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Libya, and so forth. So um, yes, we do see a spread uh, or, or, or interrelationships that are that are emerging now. I mean, from a from a br very broad level, um, Al Naba, which is the Islamic State's own propaganda publication, has now referred. I mean, refers to the entire Islamic State uh, superstructure in West Africa as Islamic State West Africa province. So ISGS isn't so much recognised as a separate franchise, but but part. You know, it is now actually part of ISWAP. Um, which, which up till now we understood was simply the you know, Boko Haram splinter group in the Lake Chad region. And while that announcement has been made, we've also picked up from our own research on the ground the movement of um, Nigerian militants from northeastern Nigeria, from the Lake Chad region, into northwestern Nigeria, which I talked about in, in the opening statement here, um, which is now turning into you know, a very insecure zone where we start seeing the, the, the emergence of jihadist um, cells uh, there. And from there, we've also, I wouldn't say documented, but it's at least received a number of credible reports of Nigerian, um, you know, cross-border links between, between Niger and, and Nigeria. So all of the, you know, these links are, to come back to the central point of, of the seminar and to link back to the report of um, written by Hannah, that, that, that these linkages are emerging um, out of these, these cauldrons of community conflicts that have burst open or in, you know, set the ground on fire in their different locations. It's not um, you, you know, simply because um, uh, Islamic State is, is, is so, um, you know, supremely organized that it can, it can, it can, you, you know, uh, um, forge these links across such a wide geographical z zone if it wasn't for the fact that there are these really um, serious local conflicts that have erupted in those places that facilitate that movement and that draw in all kinds of other tr troublemakers, including notably violent jihadis. Um, Melissa, do you thanks, have any thanks for that, Dino. Yeah, um, yeah I think um, we've had a lot of questions come in about, about um, the role that international partners can play in particular. Um, what, 
we've had a question from Arjun van der Waal. Um, what entry points do you see to convince the international community um, of the need for a more political rather than a military approach? I know in the report we talk about how there is a, a lot of pressure um, on Niger from international partners to have a, a military approach. Um, so, so, you know, how can, how can the international community uh, be more constructive here? Uh, Hannah, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, also, je, je voulais inviter, je sais qu'il y a des, des participants uh, nigériens sur, sur, qui étaient sur la liste de registration. Je voulais juste inviter s'il si y a quelqu'un qui veut uh, donner une question en français. Uh, on, ça nous intéresse d'avoir votre, votre avis et votre, votre engagement sur ça. Et on s'explique le fait que c'est en anglais, uh, en, en, cette, cette réunion. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's interesting because I, you, you really hear, um, you, I think there's, there's a lot of sort of noise around the need for um, a more political approach and for political solutions. And when you, when you talk to people who are sort of working on these regional bodies, um, you know, they say that it's, it's really lip service uh, and that the money, you know, is going towards military means um, and that, you know, the, there's, there's a real, um, real dearth of, you know, sort of political, political efforts. Um, this is something that, you know, I think it's, it's a little bit outside of the scope of, of this report, but it's really important issue to raise. And it's one that um, I think we, we do plan on looking at in more detail uh, within, the, within the next months. Um, I think there, especially in the last few months uh, where we've seen a, really a, a tremendous spike in um, exactions by security forces against civilians in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, um, there's a real awareness at this point in time that um, military solutions are, are, you know, face major hurdles and, and are, can be extremely problematic. And you know, uh, in, in a climate where these uh, forces have received a lot of foreign support, it also, um, you know, poses certain questions about accountability, um, you know, and, and where the buck stops. Um, so uh, having said that, you know, I think Sometimes, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, so, so on the one hand, there's really, um, there's a really a lot more that could be done in terms of the political approach. I think that that needs to be led by the states themselves. Um, so it's, it's really a question of how to, how to sort of support them. It's not um, so much a regional body or um, an international organization that, that, that can come in with solutions for the region. Um, each, each space has its own dynamics and each country has its, its strengths and weaknesses in dealing with these actors and, and its own history of dealing with these actors. Um, and so it's, it's very much, um, it very much cries out for a really tailored solution and, and not um, sort of coming in with strategies, you know, that have been determined somewhere else um, on the political end. Uh, on, on the military side, I think that um, some, something that we sort of discuss in this report is that sometimes the best thing, sometimes foreign actors really do sort of need to get out of the way. Um, and this was something that in looking at, to come back to the question that was asked earlier, um, you know, why did, why did dialogue fall apart? Uh, when there was, you know, in 2016, there was already this, this line of communication. Um, when you look at how much, how horribly things have escalated between 2016 and 2019, um, it's a very interesting counterfactual to sort of think about, well, what if they had uh, reached some sort of agreement in, in 2016? You know, where, where would we be today? Um, and, you know, again, there are, there are reasons for that to be found in the uh, Nigerian state. And some, sometimes actors are pulling in different directions or they don't, um, you know, coordinate enough with one another. Uh, but something that did sort of come up again and again is the role of, you know, foreign foreign actors who were trying to be helpful, um, but ended up actually getting in the way of, of dialogue initiatives. Um, and to, to give an example, um, at one point there was, a, there was a bounty. So during one of our research trips, there had just been, the Americans had sort of just announced a $5 million reward for information leading to uh, Abdul Walid Sahrawi's um, arrest. You know, of course, at this point, he's, his men have been responsible for um, killing four American forces. Um, you know, he's a, he's a very high value target for Americans. Um, this is, you know, a different way of, of perhaps of dealing with things than the Nigerians themselves, um, who at one point were willing to, you know, sort of talk um, and at least explore, you know, 
uh, other options than killing him. Uh, and so since, since, you know, since that point, since this reward was, was created, um, people who, a few people who were involved in mediation told me it's become a lot harder to reach out to um, people, men who work closely with Abu Walid. He's become more inaccessible. Um, and they felt like this effort was, was directly, um, was, was an, impediment, an impediment, an obstacle, without wanting to be, was an obstacle to, to Niger's own dialogue efforts. Uh, and I think, you know, in terms of the, the French military has ideas about counterterrorism and wiping out targets and the American military, of course, also has these similar ideas about wiping out high value targets. Um, but it's very important to remember that Niger is the one who is going to be dealing with um, the aftermath of these, of these projects. Uh, and I think that there, you know, there, there should be more efforts to um, think about other, other alternatives that, that may not be the, the sort of um, the ones that, you know, the, the counter-terrorist approach. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Dina, do you have anything to, to add on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, just maybe sum it up uh, in very simple terms. Look at the evidence. The evidence uh, suggests or shows very clearly that the more militarization has taken place in the Sahel, the more we've seen the, the, the problem uh, expand. And that's not to suggest that militarization is causing this problem, but it's certainly not resolving it either. Um, and so, you know, when, to link back to one of Hannah's comments, you know, in the case of Niger, again, to use this example of local security units, what is the priority on the ground at any given space? Who are you actually targeting to do what? Um, there really needs to be a differentiated, tailored solution for different types of circumstances. This is also the risk of bringing cookie cutter solutions that are designed you know, by, by, by broad um, regional umbrella groups who, when they work with authorities, aren't necessarily informed correctly of what's actually going on on the ground. So, um, for example, if, 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 if there were to be um, units comprised of more Fulani in, in Tilaberi operating in that zone with a more um, uh, protection of civilians uh, operational mandate, would that resolve the problem better than perhaps um, uh, embarking on heavy militarized operations, which in the aftermath of what has happened in, in, at the end of last year, um, you know, the attacks in, 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 in Inates and, and, and elsewhere, where the Nigerian security forces were heavily, um, you, you know, scorched, um, that um, their response to date has, has been met with, um, you know, increasing amount of allegations of, of human rights abuses on the ground, which which suggests that this is not going very well. Um, so, um, yes, I would say, you know, have, have a differentiated approach. Um, that also means that at certain times, military operations may, may well work. And I circle back to the example of, of Brookdale. That's not to say that, um, you know, international partners such as France in the area shouldn't be looking for um, jihadist leaders and, and trying to eliminate them, um, but should think very carefully about you know, whether the scope of those operations should then be so widened that they then, um, you know, create more problems on the ground than, than, than they solve. Thanks. I mean, related to this question of, of the military, and I know we've often talked about there being a sort of a security traffic jam in, um, in the region, and especially, you know, um, there are a so there are also local uh, initiatives, regional initiatives, and, and we have a question from David Smith in, um, in Johannesburg asking about the role for the G5, whether um, you know, they can play a positive and, or negative role, um, both the, the military and the civilian side. Um, and you know, allied to this, we've seen recently that you know, the, um, not direct, directly linked specifically to Niger, but that, that uh, the, the African Union is also keen to deploy, deploy additional troops to the region uh, to, to help with the, the crises in Central Sahel. So it'd be interesting to, to sort of have you talk about the sort of various regional actors and, and you know, how, how effective or ineffective they, they can be in, in Niger and in the Central Sahel uh, more broadly. Uh, okay, I'm not muted. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I think w one thing that we're seeing now is, is the sort of arrival of, of new military actors. Uh, the G5 is sort of in the process of coming online and, and becoming operational. Um, we have the uh, task force Takuba, which is uh, planning to become operational, I believe, in, in summer of 2021. Um, we have this new talk of a, an AU um, deployment of, of 3,000 men. Um, you know, all of these, you know, sort of... Um, so, so there are new, you know, there's, there's new deployments and some of them haven't really been made yet. Um, you know, so far in terms of how we've seen them um, discussed and, and presented, uh, they're, they're, they're very much continuous with what's already there, which is to say, you know, um, various often fragmented uh, military efforts um, who don't seem to really be um, to fit into any sort of political strategy. Um, and, and often it's, it's not really clear how they uh, relate to one another. Um, so, you know, just, just to, to not to sound too, too bleak on that front, um, there, there is interest, there are resources, and, and there, are more, um, there are more forces that are sort of uh, on their way to, to, to come. But I mean, this, this is very much in the vein of, of what we were saying earlier, which is that, um, you know, we see the investments being made uh, on the side of, of military operations. Um, sometimes it's not a despite military operations instability increased. It's a because of military op operations instability increased. Um, and now we have more that are that are set to deploy. And it's not really clear. Um, it's not really clear how they would do things differently. So I think I think you know what's important to to, to important questions to ask when it comes to these these new forces and sort of how will they learn from the mistakes of um, that, that other forces have made and are, and are still making uh, on the ground. Um, how will they ensure that they coordinate with one another and um, you know where do they stand with respect to um, political strategies which you know again is something that get, gets paid a lot of lip service but um, when it comes down to uh, actual, you know, resources and, and um, strategies, we don't see, we don't really see enough of it. Dina? Yeah, uh, I mean, just to compliment what, what Anna has said on, on, on some of these, um, uh, you know, re regional architecture and other international actors coming into the, into the space. I mean, recently, when, when talking about, um, uh, when, when ECOWAS, the regional organization, was talking about its own efforts to um, combat the spread of, of violent jihadism throughout the region, they, they commit, the, the countries committed amongst themselves to raise a billion dollars. I mean, it just doesn't seem likely at this moment that that, that kind of money is going, is going to um, come easily. And wouldn't these governments do better to perhaps focus on uh, um, more achievable things that sm smaller things that could have greater value, um, border security, better intelligence gathering, um, you know, uh, uh, these sorts of um, tools that, that can situate themselves and um, lead to a better kind of political solutions or better political understanding of what they're dealing with on the ground, rather than deploying heavy um, heavy architectures that are going to be prone to cookie cutter solutions. Thank, thanks, Dina. We've, we've only got probably about five or six minutes left for the discussion. So I'd like to sort of bring it back to, to Niger and the conflict in Niger itself. I mean, we, we have a question from Mamane Kaka uh, Tuda Kaka. Um, who who wants to know um, if it's if it really is possible for for, for dialogue between um, jihadists and the authorities in in Niger? And this is a, a question that a number of people have asked. So Hannah, I don't know if you can address that. Um, yes, yeah, I think it's it's not only possible; it's it's quite promising. And we've seen um, on on multiple levels, we've seen a, a willingness on the side of the Nigerian authorities. Um, this may seem uh, it, they're not very vocal about it or public about it. In part, I think because it's it's still a bit taboo um, this this idea of sort of dialogue with with jihadis. But um, 
you know, sort of beneath, beneath the surface, there have been multiple initiatives to reach out to groups um, to try to get men to turn themselves in. Um, these are not perfect efforts and, and sometimes they um, don't have a, may not have a, a lot to look forward to. So if you take, for example, the uh, Indifa where the, the Nigerians were able to um, get several hundred Boko Haram members to, to turn themselves in. Um, and, and then they were sort of, what, what happened after that was, was not very good and sort of a deterrent for other militants thinking about handing themselves in. Um, but, you know, the, the, the will is there and the initiatives are there. Um, and, you know, there's, there's certainly openness to it. And in some cases, um, you can see you know, in some cases you can, you can see sort of steps, steps in the right direction, but then there are, um, there are, you know, other things that sort of cause it to, cause it to, to fall apart. But um, yes, I mean, you know, all of that is to say that, yes, it's not only, it's not only possible, it's, it's, it's already happening. Um, and I think, um, you know, one important element to mention is, the, you know, there's a lot of resistance as the casualties of security forces uh, of Nigerian security forces rise, you know, as we, as we started off by saying they lost 160 men within the space of, of a month. Um, you know, this makes, this makes it really unpalatable for security forces to sort of think about making any sort of concessions or entering into any sort of um, negotiation with groups. Um, and that's, and that's a serious, that's a serious thing to sort of contend with and, and you can understand sort of why they would feel that way. Um, but there are, there are initiatives and, you know, to, to, just kind of reiterate the point, um, there needs to be sort of more coordination at the, at the central state level on, on issues like this. Um, and then, you know, just to add, to add one more thing to that, I mean, you know, there's, there's this sense, it's interesting because when you talk to various people and when I talk to various people in, in Niamey about, you know, how do you, how do you handle a group like this? You know, on the one hand, they have a really um, clear precedent uh, because they've dealt with Tuareg rebellions and they've, they've actually, you know, for the, at, at the moment, they've, um, you know, created a level of decentralization, of integration of Tuaregs into the security forces, into um, prominent positions of governance uh, that has actually been really successful. And so they have this, this quite recent precedent um, for sort of dealing with these kinds of um, issues when it comes to alienated border communities who, who take up arms and, and attack the state. Um, on the other hand, uh, th there's a tendency to not really see this in that vein um, because of the sort of the whole logic of terrorism and you know al-qaeda and the islamic state there's this sense that you know oh these are these are not people we could ever um, discuss with you know these are there's it, it's a real deterrent you know that sort of logic and that sort of um narrative is is a real um you know it, it sort of blocks off a lot of possibilities so you know as, as we mentioned in the report you know there's this sense that with abu wadid sahrawi who and the region has, has acquired a reputation um, as, you know, a relatively sort of someone you can, you can reason with and who has pulled off some pretty impressive feats, which is um, drawing a, a lot of different communities into his organization um, and making them feel represented. Uh, but there's this sense that, you know, oh, we, we, could never, we could never talk to him or we could never deal with him because, you know, he's a terrorist and he's a foreigner and, and we can only kill him. Um, and so as we, as we mentioned in the report, you know, I think it's, it's really important to sort of suggest that the Nigerian authorities um, use a little more imagination when they think about this issue. Um, you know, one of the reasons is, let's say they did kill him, uh, what would happen? You know, would, would this fracture into a number of different groups that would be fighting one another, that would each be fighting the government, that would be harder to deal with collectively? Um, you know, there may be advantages in dealing with one leader who compared to some of his colleagues is not as prone to violence against civilians, for instance, um, and has managed to unify different communities who have a lot of enmity um, between themselves. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Hannah, and, and thanks, Dino. Unfortunately, I think that's all we've got time for because we're hitting up against the hour. Uh, it's been a really rich and interesting discussion. Um, we had lots and lots of questions and I'm really sorry we weren't able to get to them all. Um, but we, will, we have got the questions and we will try and respond um, to, to you. Uh, you know, Hannah will try her best. As I said, we've got a lot of questions, but I'd just like to thank you very much, um, everyone, uh, for your time and um, your patience. And um, I hope you'll join us again um, when we have, our, when we have an, a next event um, 
from the Africa Programme International Crisis Group. Thank you very much.